Okay, so it's recording, you guys, so I hope that's okay. Um, if we have questions at the end or whatever, I can pause the recording if we need to. Um, okay, so my topic is I think all red cars are the best. I'm the pro side for that. I come on, I say, I think all red cars are the best. Here are three supported reasons, or five, or four, or however many you have. <clears throat> And you back them up with research. So, you know, you've done research that red makes people happy, that kind of stuff. Um, red paint is cheapest. Again, you've done research, that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> then you conclude, therefore, because of this, this, and this, red cars are the best. That is your presentation. That should take, um, just looking here. I think I said 15 to 20 minutes. <clears throat> oh, 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and it can go up to 20 if you want, uh, if you've got a lot of stuff to say. Um, so that would be the pro side. And you'd send me your videos. Now, you don't have to record on the same thing. If you each want to make a different video, especially if you aren't getting together with people for whatever reason, um, that's fine. I'll put them both up. Just use the same PowerPoint um, uh, deck so that it'll have some continuity. So you put that up or you give it to me and I'll put, I'll put, I'll put the link up on like this. I'll put it on YouTube. It'll be private. So no one else can see it except your class through the link. Then the pro, the con side will do the same thing. We do not think that all cars should be red because this, this, and this blue is a much more calming color. It'll help in traffic. And we researched it. Um, at the end of each of your presentations, you're going to put, your um, references. Um, APA format is good. If you're not sure how to do APA format, the nice thing is most references, um, there will be a link that you can copy and it asks what format you want. You pick APA um, or definitely text the library or not text, but um, they have an online chat or email them. They are excellent. If you're having problems finding information on the topic, these people are trained in information getting. So they will definitely help. They've definitely helped me finding stuff for um, my, my papers um, when I was working on my uh, doctoral stuff. So they're really, um, they're really great resources and we're very lucky uh, to have them. Anyway, so that's the pro and con. It's basically the presentation. So then this is where we get to uh, the rebuttal. So normally you'd be standing in front of the class and there'd be rebuttal and stuff, but this year you don't have to do that. What we're going to do is use the discussion forum where each team asks the other team questions. So um, the Con will write, and, and it, I've uh, split it out for where to write your discussion questions on Blackboard. I'll show you that in a sec. Um, <clears throat> the con will say, maybe to the pro, so you think red cars are the best because the, the paint is cheaper. Well, we found when we were researching that paint has to be layered three times in red cars, whereas in blue, it's only two. So you as red have to answer that and defend your position. And I want you to ask at least one question for each of the other team members. So one for pro, one for con, and that's each of you on a team. So if the cons are asking pro, the cons would ask, one con person would ask two questions and then the other would ask two. So this is, um, this is just how you can uh, show that you listened and come up with 
holes in arguments. Because when you're researching anything, and especially for uh, any of you that are thinking of going into either the MPAC program in Saskatchewan or the Masters of Accounting at the U of A, <clears throat> um, this is the kind of thing you're going to have to be kind of um, familiar with. So you ask the questions and you have to do that by, oh, your debate videos have to be by the Sunday night before the deadline. That way, if any of the um, videos are messed up or whatever, we've got some time. Rebuttal questions. You have to ask them on Tuesday, and then I give you pretty much 24 hours here until Wednesday to answer the questions. And then if you wanna continue the discussion, um, at least in class, I've had a few debates where <clears throat> they've gone far beyond the, the time or wanted to go far beyond the time in class. Sometimes it's restrictive, but, um, and they've raised some really good points and it, it's become very interesting. Um, Cause some of these topics are things that you guys in your careers are going to be dealing with. So it, it's kind of neat. So after that's all done on Wednesday night, then the class, and this is where 2% of your grade is going to ask questions following the debate and it'll be on the Thursday. So each pro or con team member must be asked a question by the other debate team. So that's where on this schedule on page two, which is revised, you guys, so sorry about having to change this. Um, so for example, debate two happens to be the first debate now. I left the numbers the same so I didn't mess anything up. So your videos are due on October 3rd. You're gonna present on October 5th. That's when the pro and con rebuttal questions are gonna be due and this is all at midnight. 11.59 that night, and then your response to the rebuttal is due on the 6th. Now, the debate group or class members to ask the questions are group 6. So right now we don't have anyone in group 6, but I'm hoping by the end of Friday we will. So group 6 will ask questions, and then that's due Thursday, and then the other group, because of course they've been on, 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 Group two, both pro and con, have till Sunday to get to them. And again, there could be ongoing debate from that too, if any of these debates really strike your fancy. Um, any, any questions on how the debates will run and what you have to do? Um, I just have a question on where we go to sign up for groups. Oh, you're going to email me. So right now, um, the ones that are free are one, three, five, six, and seven. So should so, we just email the class to see who's looking for partners or what's the best way to go about that? Sure. Um, that's a really good question. Um, <laughs> If you don't have a group already, just email me and I'll put you I'll put you in one. So do it by debate. So if you go, you know what, I really like debate three. Email me, say I don't have a group. Can you please put me in debate three? And then the other people who are in debate three can also be added. Does that make sense? Sure. Um what any other questions you guys like? Does that make sense to you? Because I know you haven't had a chance to meet, and of course today was a chance to meet. So, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about this. Anyone else? Okay. So, if you haven't got a group, just email me. I'll put you in and tell me which debates and give me a choice of three. Your one, two, and three choice. I'll put you in. Okay, and in the chat, I don't know if you saw that, you guys, um, someone's looking for a group member. So if you want to join, go ahead. Yeah, why, you know what? Why don't we 
just take a couple minutes. If you are looking for a group member, put that up in the chat. Or if you just want to list yourself single, that's fine too. Now, you guys, I don't know if you've played around with uh, Dropbox. Dropbox, oh my God, not Dropbox. Um, oh, sorry, well, you guys, my head just isn't quite all, all back yet. But on Blackboard, the email, if you email someone, does it show you their email address? Because I know when I email people, even if I emailed four of you to give you your, like, for your group, it doesn't show you each other's email addresses from my perspective. How about you guys? Anyone notice? Okay. Well, um, if you want, you guys, while this class is going on, it's recorded, so if you miss anything... Uh, you can do this, but you, in chat, of course, with this, you know from last year probably, you could chat to different people. So if you see their name up there and you want to exchange um, emails, go ahead and do that in the chat. Just email the particular person. And if you don't have anyone's emails, I do have them on my main list. And if you're in the group and you say, okay, we're all in a group, we don't have each other's emails yet, let me know and I'll send your group emails. Does that make sense? Yes, no, maybe. Can we stop? Sorry? I missed that. I heard someone speaking, but no? Okay. So I'm going to keep on, you guys. Just keep just interrupt me um, if it's not making sense or you need more information. Okay. So that's how the debates are going to work. And you'll notice some of these topics we haven't even talked about yet. We haven't talked about anything yet because I'm not chapter one and two, but we'll be coming to them as we get um, going on. Sorry, I was reading the chat. I can't do two things at once. We'll be coming to them as we go through on the text. One thing you want to maybe want to do, especially if you want to start preparing early, is look at the... Um, textbook for some of these topics and that'll give you a good start because at the end of every chapter is a list of different papers you can look at the other place you'll want to look and i'll put this in the group chat is google scholar some people find google scholar is the best place to search for papers you can go into the library and use their databases and stuff, but I find those difficult to manage. Google Scholar gives you access to everything. And um, if you look at Google Scholar, and I'm just going to quit sharing this debate thing for a sec and go to Google Scholar. Okay, hopefully everybody can see Google. Let me know. Shout out if you can't. So you just type in Scholar. It'll take you to Google Scholar. Now, this 
you can sign in mine I use my Gmail my personal Gmail for that but what it lets you do is once you've signed in if you go over to the left and go to my library nope wrong place give me a sec settings under settings go to settings so Google Scholar you sign in using your Gmail account I'm sure everyone has it and of course you can just make one if you don't um, you go under settings over here on the left and it says library links so what it lets you do is you can type in your library so if I type in McEwen it comes up McEwen University library I already found it so you click on it it makes it your library so you save it so then when you look at something and I was looking at I was trying to do some research in my classes with self-assessment how you assess your knowledge it will take you and in these places they both give free ones but if you didn't like let's look up oh let's look at our first topic we find our first topic give me a sec ah here it is well let's put investors are rational because that is a really that one's a pretty um <laughs> that can really get uh interesting oh there's no matches probably because I'm in my library so let's leave my library and go to articles there investors are rational and so here's one from International Journal of something all these when they come up with PDFs they're free and you can use them but if you go here that's not what I want to do. oh my god you guys I'm so sorry um it should say library <laughs> how did how are these all free which is good spreading information is excellent um traditional investors are rational anyway some of them should find should come up with find at McEwen at the bottom or maybe they've done something different oh you can view as html all four versions again they're all free and accessible really good news um I have never had that before so this is very interesting at any rate sometimes they're only available from libraries that have bought the, the documents or the databases so you just go there now let's say you don't have access you couldn't get it to work all you do is you copy this and you tell the library copy it to the library in the chat or in an email and say I'm looking for this because I'm researching this can you help me get this article they are wonderful it is their job they they live for information so go ahead and do that so again that's Google Scholar and if you put your library in anyway I swear these things change every day any questions about Google Scholar okay so any lasting questions about the debate if you will notice there was a, a evaluation form at the end of that one document and it basically tells you how um, you'll get marked let me just share that again okay so here's the presentation evaluation it's the last page and the way I mark it is no is pretty much zero to three four to six is somewhat and seven to ten is yes 
And I put those numbers in in my little Excel spreadsheet and it adds it all up. So you'll notice for presentation skills, because um, you're online, I took out some of the things that are usually here. Things you're looking at is a stable, established and maintain comfortable eye contact. So kind of look at your screen now because our screens and our cameras don't always line up. You could be looking away from your screen. That's fine. The key thing I don't want is you just looking down and reading. So for this, your camera has to be on you guys. And confidence, competence, emotion, you know, all the usual things that you have to watch out for when you're speaking. Used audio visual aids that assisted understanding. So if you've got a diagram or something in your slides, then it's clear and it fits with what you're doing. Um, maintained audience interest, uh, delivered a professional presentation, that kind of thing. And then I'll put comments in here for that. One of the reasons this debate, or not debate, but the presentation is so important is that in Capstone 1, if you're going through the CPA, and I've both been a session leader for this and also been uh, a marker for the presentation, is you're preparing a big consulting document and it's really on the skills of uh, the stuff you did in court, will be doing in core two, which is the finance and the strategy, that kind of stuff rather than um, financial accounting, audit and tax, that's core one. Core two is finance, oh my God, I'm drawing a blank. Finance managerial accounting strategy. So you're doing a whole consulting document on this with a group and you do have to present. And um, now some of them, this last session, it was all online because of COVID. So I'm patterning exactly what they did with the questions and everything. Um, just so you can kind of be used to it. But this is something definitely you're going to have to do for CPA and you're going to have to do it in a group. So it gives you a nice little practice. So then the structure and then the rebuttal. And the main thing here is answer questions clearly and gave answered consistent with presentation materials. Now, one thing I can say if, is if you're doing this live, but also when you're doing it written, is sometimes they'll ask their questions and it won't be clear. You should ask for clarification. And you guys that are asking questions, you've got pretty much not even 24 hours, 12, 16 hours you can ask questions. Um, don't wait till the last minute, but, you know, kind of double check that day because if they want a clarification, you should give it. However, you guys that are on the debate team or presentation team, if your question isn't answered clearly, like if you said, can you clarify that? Well, then you say, I assume this is what you're asking. Okay. And you've got to give answers consistent with presentation material. So just to make sure you're staying consistent and you know what you've done. Um, so that's that section. Any questions about um, this? The whole debate is worth 20%. 16 is on the recorded presentation. 4% is on this bottom rebuttal questions. Any questions about the presentation? Okay. And if you don't want to ask questions here, you guys just send me an email, especially you guys um, that are doing two and going first, just so you know, and this happens with everybody that goes first. I'm always a little more hmm, forgiving because you're setting the tone for everyone. And it is hard to go first when you haven't seen, uh, presentation first. Um, okay, so that's the presentations. 
you guys um, workout groups if you just if you don't have a group just tell me the debates you want email it to me i'll put you in one and everything will fill up now let's say debate six didn't fill up i only had one person and debate five only had three i'll put you in five or something like that or there's two and two i'll move you together okay questions Okay, so I've also put up how to do the discussion portion of your final mark. Um, and you did get a sense of that when you were here the first day. Sorry, you guys, the sharing business, I just have to get back to it. Okay, so you should see the discussion portion document up now. It's 10% of your final mark. You guys that managed to answer something on day one, and I gave you that whole week to do it, have earned 1% that doesn't count for here. So you, it's 1% on top. So if you get a 78 in the course, you get a 79. Um, so debate questions, I already talked about that. Oh, one thing though, your questions for the debate. So you're the class and how relevant your questions are and how they relate to the debate presented is worth 2%. And you are marked individually on those questions, okay? Otherwise your debate is a group mark. The reason I do that, and I know it frustrates some students um, especially like the pros marked separately and the con, that's what I mean by the group. So the pros get marked separately, the cons, and the reason I mark them together is that's how you're going to be in CPA. Also in real life, you go on a presentation because they're asking for auditors and they want you to present something. Well, your teams mark together. They don't say, well, you know what? We want you. Uh, Sandy to be our auditor and Stephen mm, not so much you were a little too I don't know boisterous aggressive whatever um, that is one thing you guys and I'm just telling you this just from my experience with capstone one although you're not answering these questions in front of each other try not to get aggressive I have actually seen CPA candidate groups one of one member just kind of gets really aggressive and doesn't attack the panel but well it sort of attacks the panel you know we said this and i don't know why you're asking that and it was like okay <laughs> that's 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 over the top right you, you don't do that as a group coming in to present a solution as a consultant so uh just be careful with that okay any questions with that Okay, then I would like to go to chapter one and two. Okay, wait one second, I just have to uh, share. Didn't mean to start my video. Okay, I am sharing PowerPoint and we are going to put it in. Actually, can you see the PowerPoint like this? Give me a hand wave. Oh, yes, thank you. Thanks, you guys, for. Um, participating this way. I really appreciate it. Um, you know what? I'm just, if, um, I just have to pop out for a second. Um, if you can just talk 
you know more about the debate with each other or email each other exchange emails go ahead and do that i'll just be back in five more minutes so give me five. Oh, and i'll mute it so you don't hear my dogs barking or something Sorry about that, you guys. This is one of the reasons we are not. Hi everyone, sorry about that little delay. Um, oh, which topics are available again? I can tell you, debate one, three, five, six, and seven. Did that go through? Yes. Um, okay. Yeah, so those are the debates that are left. Just looking at the topics, um, I mean, okay, I'm a little biased, but I think they're all interesting. But, uh, Oh, financial markets are efficient and therefore stock prices accurately represent the value of firm. That's a good one. Um, I've had lots over the years. Um, I've had versions of these same topics and uh, there have been very interesting inclusions. One of my favorite was a student who said, really, the stock market is just gambling. And he was so so down and you know like kind of had to explain and talk them out of that little cycle but number three is an interesting one the present value model of accounting is superior to historical historical costs that's one it's a pretty basic one um but you can definitely find information um a good one is u.s gap versus canadian gap and i'll talk a little bit about that in the um Sorry, chapter one and two. Oh, the level of remuneration which corporate CEOs receive is appropriate. That's another one that brings a lot of um, what's the word? Discord. 
Number six, a litigious society will encourage relevant financial information. And litigious society, you guys, all that means is more likely to sue. So Canada isn't really a litigious society, whereas the U.S., as we all know from our exposure to their media, they sue at the drop of a hat. So that's what's talking there. Oh, and allowing managers to manage your earnings is beneficial for capital markets. You know, if, uh, if your earnings are all over the place, up and down like a crazy thing, that gives more risk, right? So... If you can manage it to smooth it out a little, isn't that better? Doesn't that present a better picture? And then you can argue on both sides. So all the debates um, that are left, I mean, number one is kind of, hmm, not as exciting, but um, it's, it's good too. Any last questions on the debate? Okay, let's talk about chapters one and two. Now, this really is a survey of kind of what the whole course is going to be about. And it is a very um, broad chapter, so it covers a lot. So, and I'm just going to leave it this way because then I can type on it. So I'm not going to address all of these. A lot of this, you guys, you read in the text. And it makes total sense because you don't know all about it. So you'll notice that first chapter takes you through the history from what the 1600s of the development of standards of accounting and drawing back to your first day assignment. I just wanted to make some comments on that because it is going to relate to um, what we do. Now I can't find them. I have them all printed out. Oh, I left them in my other folder at work. Darn. Anyway, what I saw, there was a lot of auditing. And um, I like the things that people brought in that I thought spoke to your experience, at least up to now, of the stock market. And in a number of you, you said looking at criminal or ethical activities. And we're going to do um, a chapter on that where you can actually test your ethical, I guess, behavior against other students, other managers in this big study that was done. So I really like that. Um, a lot of you jumped right into the standards that you're used to having. So I guess that's good. We taught you financial accounting and you're, you're, you've, you've bought into it at least. At any rate, um, I found it very interesting to read you guys. Some of them uh, made me laugh. Um, but uh, yeah, it was good. Thank you for all the thought you guys put into that. Okay, so overall, you know that accounting standards had to develop. Right now, we're dealing with IASB, which of course is the international standards. FASB is the U.S. and ACSB is the Canadian Accounting Standards. Notice Canadian uses this for ASB and this for public companies. So search for basic accounting concepts builds on theories from other fields. In reality, you guys, accounting and finance came out of economics. Economics is the basis for what's happening here. It drives um, our knowledge and our development here. So efficient securities market, how efficient is the security market? Securities being stocks and bonds, you guys. So for example, look at the difference between a security market where they give information out every quarter and all that kind of stuff versus think of a used car market. When you go, let's say you're buying a used car and you go to look for a used car, do you have all the information? And feel free, you guys, to unmute yourself and talk or answer in the chat. Like, do you feel comfortable if you look up, I don't know, Kachiji, Auto Trader, 
or you go to any of the dealers or the go 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 autos and they've priced a car I'll go with the Yaris because I have my little Yaris from the, when they first came out in Canada and I love it um, are you comfortable and they say oh we want I don't know eight thousand dollars for whatever year do you have all the information Oh, thank you, Isaac. No, you don't. Even an inspection can miss important faults. Okay, excellent. So one of the biggest pieces that makes a security market or stock market efficient and effective is the information that's out there. A used car market doesn't have all the information. Now, AutoTrader in the last few years brought out um, <clears throat> It gives you more stats, like you can look up stats for your cars and what they've sold for and stuff, which gives you more information, but it still doesn't give you enough information about that specific car. So an inspection or those car facts reports, they give you some information, but not enough. So you are not as comfortable going here and buying a car as you might be if you had a lot more information. Um, anyway, so that's that talks about efficiency and efficient security markets. The big thing is information here. So if you can add on information, that's key. Rational decision making, you guys. Up until recently and still now Chicago University of Chicago is the university that came up with the whole idea of efficient security markets, did the studies, did all that. They will stick, stick to that <laughs> until something forces them to change. And what is starting to change people is rational decision making. And are investors rational? That's a big question individually and we'll do examples of this you guys as we go through this is a kind of fun course in parts um we make horrible decisions for example let's say you you've got your significant other you've been together for i don't know however many months and you go you know i'm not sure this is working out or other people are saying, you know, I don't think it's working out. And you think, yes, it is. Well, are you more likely to go and listen to your friends? Like, let's say you think, oh, yeah, it's going fine. That say, oh, yeah, it's going fine. Or are you more likely to seek out people that say, no, that's it. You, you guys should break up. It's not working. Anyone? I mean, you'll look for whatever uh, confirms your bias. Exactly. And that is critical. Um, any of you who are interested can check out um, Kahneman and Tversky. They, uh, one of them sat and died. I can't remember which one, but they, they won a Nobel Prize for their work on rationality in humans. And um, they have come up with some amazing, amazing work. And we're going to be looking at that. Now, the nice thing is, the more trained you are in a field, the less likely you are to do that. So supposedly, if you were, say, a psychologist, and you were trained in couples therapy and all that kind of stuff, you would be more objective and more able to assess your relationship. Now that doesn't always work, but it can. And in the same way, in the financial arena, if you're assessing stocks, if you're a trained CFA, you're probably making a better decision than Joe off the street. So a lot of times, and again, we'll talk about all this later, um, rational, investing they put to the pension funds because if there's enough pension funds pension funds are huge 
And if they're in the markets and they're all running by trained professionals, we can assume then they're lending a lot of, sec not security, rationality to the market. But we'll talk about that later, you guys. Some of these topics I'm gonna go on because they've got whole chapters on them. So I'll just try and uh, be quick. So I'll leave it for later, but I disagree with that. Do you disagree with what? That uh, they lend a lot of rationality to the markets. The pension funds. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Okay, I'm looking forward to that when we talk about stock market efficiency. Okay, and did you already pick yours? Is there a rational one? Hopefully on the rational. Uh, uh, I think we sent an email asking for a few of them. I don't know if that's one of the ones we asked for, but I'll cross my fingers that it is. Okay, <laughs> it sounds good. Okay, now agency theory that comes in is an agent acts on the on behalf. So an agent acts on behalf of the principal. The way you can usually think of it is think of it, you started your own company, okay? You've got your own store, consulting company, whatever it is, accounting firm. Well, over time, it's gonna grow. And all of a sudden, you're entrusting decisions to other people. That's the agent, you're the principal. So in the same way, the stock market, the investors are trusting the people running the company. And that raises lots of issues that um, we have to look at. So again, this is a glimpse of the whole course. So collapse of the stock market boom of the late 1990s, the biggest thing, and you guys have heard about this, although most of you probably weren't alive, um, hadn't been born yet. Enron, WorldCom, they were hiding information in different, in this case, Enron in particular, special purpose entities. So they were hiding their debt through a related company, but because of the rules at the time, and I don't know if you guys have done consolidations yet, um, but if you're in my 410, we'll get to it. It said, oh, you don't have to consolidate. So all of a sudden this debt is hidden in another company that investors aren't seeing. That's a lot of what happened with Enron and WorldCon. So public confidence crashed, the effects on final reporting, because all of this is how it can relate to us as accountants to be. Increased regulations, so you know the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, and of course in Canada it was Bill 198. Ours is so much more exciting sounding. Um, in Canada, and that's called CSOX. And you probably covered this in auditing and stuff. And they tighten the rules regarding off-balance sheet entities. So you can't park your debt in something else. Causes of the market meltdown in 1708. Um, fair value for accounting financial instruments ended up being liquidity pricing. So what they did was took the value of some of these financial instruments. They packaged mortgages, loans and stuff into derivative type instruments and we're selling those and there were different levels of risk although overall they were pretty much listed as risk as at low risk which was a mistake anyway so liquidity pricing is when fair value is less than the value in use so the banks were arguing when this came up, your value in use means, let's say you have bonds or stocks. And actually this applies you guys, when you think of um, stocks, who can invest in riskier stocks at this point in their lives, you guys or me? Yeah, you guys, why? And you can be you can be blunt. Well, you guys are young. I'm old, right? 
You have longer, that sounds very good, longer to bear out the risk. That sounds good because I'm going to retire soon, right? So, for example, some of my colleagues who were retiring or planning to retire after 07, 08, like, you know, 09, they were planning to retire. Well, that put this meltdown, put a real kibosh on their ability to retire. They had to put it off, hoping the market would go up, and it did. So, um, so what this is saying is value in use. If you kept the bonds or the loans in this case for a long time till its maturity, well, its value is much higher than if you tried to sell it now when it was really crashing. So they said, Hey, you know what? Fair value, which is liquidity pricing is less than value in use. We shouldn't be using fair value accounting. Okay, so that was one of the issues that came. There was also high leverage of financial institutions. Financial institutions are a bit different than other institutions with regards to accounting standards. Again, they have off balance sheet liabilities, which they thought they'd stop with SOCs, but they didn't. There were little loopholes. Before SOX, they used special purpose entities, and after they used VIUs, which are now escaping me what they're called. Give me a sec. SIV, Structured Investment Vehicles. Same idea, they found a loophole. And what it did was said, if the beneficiary, whoever the beneficiary is, if there's a different beneficiary, they don't have to be consolidated. So essentially they use these expected loss notes. You can read more about it in the text to avoid consolidation. This is the key point. They avoided consolidation. So once again, investors didn't know they had all this debt. So the response, again, that's what's key to us. Responsive standard setters, guidance for fair value, increased use of internal estimates, so value in use. You know, if we're holding it to maturity, what happens? Increased disclosure, responsive other regulators like the SEC, increased disclosure of managerial compensation. The reason is, and we're going to get into this in a big way, um, is managers get compensated in different ways, short-term, medium-term, long-term. But the short-term is on net income. It's their bonus, right? So they have a reason to manage their earnings. They also put increased capital reserves for financial institutions. Now, in Canada, you notice we escaped a lot of this with our banks. We didn't have banks failing. The reason is we are we have federal federally regulated banks and they're tighter controls. So they weren't able to play around with all these derivatives as much as the American banks were. That's why we were somewhat protected from this. So yay Canada. Okay. So implications for accounting. Again, you guys, this is always critical. We want to bring it back to accounting. Things have to be transparent, value and use versus fair value accounting. Value and use is how long are we going to keep things for? Let's value it that way. Full disclosure, off balance fight and off balance sheet activity. Sorry, you guys. And new accounting standards to prevent further abuses. Now this, you guys, you are heading into accounting careers. So this is the kind of thing you're going to have to deal with. And as we go through this, I'll show you examples of new accounting standards that have been developed in the last few years and so on. Okay. I'm going through this quite quickly, you guys, because a lot of it you can just read in the text. Efficient contracting. You want to minimize the costs of contracting. So if, let's say we were some kind of creditor and we were going to lend money to a company. Well, would we just say, well, here you go, here's the money. No, first we check into it, right? But is there anything we put in our contract with them 
that would help to ensure that we'd be paid. Could you think of anything? Well, what are some ratios? Okay, a limit on the amount of debt they can have. Excellent. So the ratio of debt to equity could be, we could put a limit on how much they can keep and retained earnings. We can make sure they have a high current ratio. Um, all different kinds of ratios that we can look at and a minimum earning power. So different kinds of ratios like times interest earned there that we can put into our contract so that we don't have to worry and it doesn't become costly to us. That's what it's talking about. So they're looking at debt contracts, also compensation contracts with managers. And you can read that, read that, read that. Okay, ethical behavior. Actually, with these meltdowns, auditors have been complicit. Um, Arthur Anderson used to be a firm and Enron, during the Enron crisis and they actually dissolved because it was so bad. So the question is, do you serve the client or serve society, right? Which one do you do? Um, ethical principles require you to do the right thing. Um, but the definition of what's ethical is gray. So, um, auditors are not stuck, but they're sitting there going, well, we can get continued audit track, um, contracts if we do what the firm wants. On the other hand, they should be saying, let's do what's right. And if we don't get the contract and some other guys are willing to do whatever it takes, well, that's okay because we're protecting the profession, that kind of thing. Does that make sense, you guys? And I'm going over this quite quickly because each chapter really has some of these topics in them. Okay, rules base versus principle base. Rules are where you set very strict um, standards. Um, whereas principles based, which is IFRS, we've moved that far, is you're trying to reach an ideal, really. It's, does it fit in with what we mean? So, for example, think of driving rules. <coughs> Everybody has to stop at stop signs, right? That's a law. That would be a rules-based standard. You don't stop, you get a ticket if there's someone there or if there's a red light camera. A principles-based standard might be, we want to keep the road safe. So you should stop to check if other traffic's coming. Well, it's 3 a.m., you're driving home. It's not a weekend night, just a regular weekday night. There is no traffic. Do you have to come to a full stop to keep it safe? Then you're making more of a decision and there's more on driver judgment. Now, we know not all drivers have good judgment. Maybe that's why we have more rules, okay? Same thing could be when you're thinking about the new 40 uh, kilometer an hour speed limit they put in all residential areas. They could have done that, which said, yep, you go over 40, you get a ticket. No matter if it's 11 o'clock, there's no kids out, there's no one walking, right? Um, or they could have said, drive safely in your neighborhoods, which most of us do, right? We see kids playing in a playground or they're on the sidewalk. You slow down in the neighborhood because they could just run out at any minute. So there's two different ways of looking at things. Rules versus principles. Any comments? Any questions? I know it's hard to do online, you guys. Next week when we're in class, we do the next chapter. It'll be better to get into this. Okay, individuals react uh, differently to the same information. 
Let's say you guys all wrote an exam yesterday and I marked it today. I tell you, um, well, you got 65. Well, some of you are going to be thrilled because you thought, oh my God, I studied all the wrong things and I bombed. Some of you are going to be very unhappy because you thought you did about a 90, right? Same information, different reactions. Same with the stock price being X. If your expectations were different than someone else's, it's going to mean different things to you. Um, however, this information that means can mean different things and can be skewed also affects how well the markets work. And again, you guys, we're going to talk a lot about this. Okay, information asymmetry. We're going to talk about these two things throughout the whole thing. Adverse selections, one or more parties to a business transactions, information advantage over the others. For example, I'm the CEO or a VP. I know exactly what's going to happen. We're thinking of a merger with another company and so on. Does the general public know that? No. Do investors know that? No. So I have an information advantage. Legally, can I act on that? Can I go out and um, do I want to do buy shares now while they're cheap? No. So adverse selection can lead to things like insider trading. Moral hazard is the other side. So information asymmetry, all it means is it's not symmetrical. Not everybody has the same information. One of the types is adverse selection. The other is moral hazard. One or more parties to a contract can observe their action, but other parties can't. For example, we're the board of directors of a large company made up of investors, right? Well, we have to hire a CEO. Can we watch the CEO every day? No. So, we can't observe their actions. So they could be doing who knows what, and we can't see it until later when we get some information. And that's where accounting information comes in. And both types of information asymmetry affect the efficient working of the economy. Does that make sense? Again, a whole chapter on this. So accounting information helps control adverse selection because it gives information to people. And it helps control moral hazard because when we get that accounting information, that quarterly report of net income, and see that our new CEO has done nothing, in fact, net income's gone down, we can react to it. So that's what our role as accounting does. It gives information to people. Does that make sense? Okay, <clears throat> so fundamental pr problem of financial accounting. Best measure of net income control adverse selection is not the same best measure to control moral hazard. So investors want long-term firm performance. Although in the past few years, there have been more, I guess, radical investors who are in, they want to make money, drive the stock price out and get out, get out and make money. They're just looking at short term gains. Generally, we think of investors as longer term. Um, <clears throat> so investors want information about future firm performance. But good corporate governance requires information about manager performance. Well, can we wait five years and assess the manager? No, we need quarterly statements for sure. Definitely yearly. So that's what we're talking about here. And again, full chapter in it. Oops, sorry, you guys. Okay, process of standard setting. You can read that. Now, this present value model with certainty and all that stuff. 
I want you to ignore guys. Do not do quantitative calculations in this chapter. Take a look at them because it's interesting to see. What it's saying is, what if we have present value accounting statements? No historical cost, just present value. It shows you the calculations for it. I'm not as concerned about the calculations because they're not really realistic, but this is um, the idea of if we knew everything, we knew cash flows, and we knew the risk-free interest rate. So that was known. Then the future outcomes are the same as current expectations. Okay? So this doesn't exist in real life. But we're starting with the assumption, what if? Then we slowly move to real life. So if it was certain, of course, the statements are relevant, reliable, dividends are irrelevant, and the reason is because they get reinvested. That's the assumption we make. So it's not that we don't care if they give dividends out, it's just it'll get back in the firm. So net income has no role in firm valuation. It's actually just the difference between present value of an asset which equals market value and how it changes year to year. So now we move from certainty to uncertainty. All of a sudden now, there's, we've got to make some assumptions. There's the states of nature. Either the company's going to do well next year or it's not. Then there's going to be probabilities. Well, we think it's going to be 60% it's going to do well and 40% it's not. And we have to have a given interest rate, okay? So that's what we were dealing with in the real world. If we were gonna do a complete present value model. So the implications with uncertainty, financial statements still are completely relevant and reliable, dividends are irrelevant. But the basis of accounting is the present value of future cash flows. And all income is, change in the expected value between the two years. Okay? So basically what this whole section is showing you is, okay, if we have certainty present value would be easy to do and our statements would be 100% correct. We don't. We live in an uncertain world. Things change. We don't know the cash flows. They could be good, bad, medium, and we don't know the interest rate. So those are the two things, cash flows, interest rates that are uncertain, okay? Because of that, we've got an expected value. An expected value, if you remember, it's just like doing your GPA. Um, you multiply um, a probability times... times the outcome, and you add it up for all the outcomes. So you take the sum of the probability times the outcomes. Okay, any questions on that? Um, expected net income and realized net income don't need to be the same. So if we said 60% chance it's going to be good, 40% chance it's bad. Well, you take the expected value. I'm just going to put it down here. Let's say it's 60% chance it's going to be 100,000. Let's say it's in millions. And 40% chance it's going to be 80,000. 
okay? That's the expected value. Now, in reality, it's either going to be 100,000 or 80,000, which is different than the expected value. So that's all it's saying. And they're saying the difference between those two numbers is the abnormal earnings. So what is this amount, you guys? I just winged it here. So we've got 60,000 plus 32, 92,000. Does that make sense? So EV is not equal to either 100,000, the good state, or 80,000. The difference is abnormal earnings. Oh gosh, you guys. Okay. If you got to go to your next class, um, don't worry about it. I will finish this off talking to myself. You guys go on and I will post this uh, recorded link. Okay. Thanks for coming, you guys. Sorry I couldn't be in person. If you have to leave, you just go ahead. Okay. Reserve recognition accounting in Canada. That's for oil and gas. And in Canada, um, it requires supplementary reserves disclosure. Um, the main thing here is reserve recognition is doing the present value of oil reserves as an asset. So the problem is the cash flows and the interest rate are uncertain. So this is an example of present value accounting. So many large firms do report under the US standard, but there's major critiques of uh, reserve recognition requirement. We need estimates of quantities, the timing of the extractions that we need to adjust. So the management reaction to RRA is concern about relevance and liability and concern about legal liability. Because if you tell your investors, oh yeah, we've got tons of these reserves and it turns out you don't, or the reserves are non-producing, then you could have legal liability on your hands. Now, one thing you do know, or we do know about reserve recognition accounting, and I did some of this years ago when I was doing my MBA, um, is that you can build in probability functions for every single thing. So you actually get quite a detailed calculation. The only thing is it changes from day to day and that makes it difficult to adjust. So some conclusions regarding uh, RRA, people think historical cost is more reliable, but it ignores the future cash flow from proven, proven reserves, which if you're looking at an oil company, you wanna know how much oil they're gonna get out. Now RRA has greater relevance, but decreased reliability. So if you remember your conceptual framework, that spell, you trade off relevance and reliability. Okay? And that's what this is talking about. Relevance versus reliability. Historical cost, very reliable not relevant. Present value, or in this example, reserve recognition accounting, great relevance, but it's not reliable because we're estimating cash flows and interest rates. So historical cost versus care and value accounting. Present day accounting uses a mixed measurement model. For example, cash and AR. Their, their um, present value, right? 
but assets like capital assets are generally still recorded at historical, even though under IFRS, we can record them at um, current value. And these are the key principles we're talking about when we're discussing the difference between current and historical. Whether is it relevant or reliability? Well, timing and revenue recognition. For historical, we have to get all the information first. So historical is slower. So there's a recognition lag again with historical. Now, matching of costs and revenue, um, the present value can do better generally. So this is the kind of stuff we're going to talk about or going to be talked about in our first debate number two. So non-existence of true net income. We make a good estimate of net income as accountants. We've got good rules set in place, the matching principle, all that kind of thing. But if we've got incomplete markets because of things like thin markets, which are not enough trading, think of it that way, um, few firms, um, lower volumes. So if we've got that, plus we have information asymmetry, and we're going to do a whole chapter on this. So not everyone has the same info. Then we've got incomplete information, and incomplete information is not good. Um, if there's no market value for whatever it is you're trying to value, you can't use it for present value. And if we have to estimate present value, true net income does not exist. Okay, the actual real net income the more estimates we put in um, to get our information, the less it becomes true net income. So that's good news for us because we're not needed if true net income exists. If someone can look at a financial statement and go, hey, the change in equity between these two things is net income and it's accurate, reliable, relevant, we wouldn't be needed but there is no true net income, so that's good. The big thing I want you to take away is judgment is critical for you guys going into accounting. Right now it seems like, oh, all I needed to do is learn some rules. Well, not so much. You need judgment, and that's what you're gonna develop over your career. Any questions on that, you guys? Well, if you do have questions, let me know. Just email me. These are the questions that um, I suggest you look at doing for this chapter. I will put up sample responses for 9 and 10. So my sample responses, so you can kind of get an idea what it, it would look like, um, especially for an exam type thing. Okay? So... Again, I apologize, I couldn't be there in person, you guys. Um, I will be hailing already next week, I better be. And um, yeah, email me with your debate groups or if you don't have a group, which debate you wanna be on, give me three choices. And I will see you guys next week in person and once everybody gives me their debate stuff, I will post a list of who's doing what when. Any questions or anything? Uh, the answers should, and I'm just going to check since I didn't put up the office hours link last time, class problem solutions. So those are in Blackboard class problem solutions.
Any other questions, you guys? That's a great question. Okay, that's all I wanted to do with you today. Sorry, we ran a little over time. My fault for not sending or posting the link, which is now posted, and you should be good for office hours. Okay, if you don't have any questions, uh, take care, and thank you guys for coming. I really appreciate it, you guys. Have a good day, too.